All right, so for our last talk of the day, um, we're lucky to have uh, Tom Halverson uh, giving the Georgia Bankart uh, Memorial Lecture. So thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, I'm very honored to be here and incredibly humbled. Is that too loud? Incredibly humbled to do this. Also, I just want to say up front, this was really hard, especially to keep it uh, in 25 minutes. Um, and every time I deleted some math, the talk got longer. So I stopped doing that. Um, but I need to get right to work. This is the only photographic evidence that I was uh, her PhD student in 1993. On the same day, Rob LaDuke and I, a really sunny day in Madison, got our PhD. I did deposit my thesis first, so I consider myself student number nine and him number 10. <laughs> um, about 15 years later in the 2000s, sometimes, we started collaborating um, and consistently did it for 10 or 15 years. And we often met at meetings that she was organizing. And I would sit around and do math. And she would run and do really important things and then come back and we'd talk some more. Um, and it was one of the best things I've ever done. Um, she's a dear friend and an incredible mentor to me. Um, during the pandemic, Arun Ram and I were asked to write a survey article about her work, uh, which appeared in March 2022. And um, unexpectedly and incredibly, she died one month later. Um, so I'm really extraordinarily grateful that she got to see this. And in fact, in the summer after she died, I went and visited her sister Paula, and we were going through some of her things. And we discovered she had taken her copy of this notices article and hid it on a high shelf that Paula couldn't reach so that she wouldn't show their neighbors. Um, <laughs> We had to hide this from her until the very last minute, and then she, we shared it with her, and she sent some really incredible detailed feedback. And so um, if you haven't seen it, I encourage you to check it out. Um, she does a lot of mathematics. It's really the broad things that she does. There are other rooms like this in other areas of algebra that think of her as one of their people um, and doing really different things in Lie theory and non-associative algebra. So it made writing this article extremely hard. I'm going to focus on the combinatorics part and a really small sliver of the combinatorics part, frankly. Um, I just There's a lot of history about um, Georgia as a mathematician in this article. I just want to highlight one thing that really struck me in thinking about this. She got her BA in 1970 from Ohio State, was a tenured professor at Wisconsin in 1979, and a full professor in 1983. So she really had a rocket trajectory. and then. To my surprise and to the surprise of many people, she retired from teaching in 2007. Many of you got to know her since 2007. Her idea of retirement is different than a lot of people's. Um, unbelievably, exactly one year later, we curated another article about Georgia. This is a memorial article about her. And I just want to point out that what we did is we just invited a whole bunch of mathematicians from many parts of her life to write. A remembrance of her, and they're really amazing. And I, some people are in this room, and I encourage you to check this out as well. Um, she's an influential scholar and a really generous collaborator. The thing I want to point out here, besides her many papers, is that she has 96 co authors. There they are. Some of you will be able to find yourself. Um, I'm not going to leave it up here long enough for you to read it all, but the slides are on Discord. Um, and she was an incredible teacher and communicator, if you got to hear her speak. So here she is giving the um, keynote talk at the International Congress of Mathematics in Seoul. Um, and you can see she has many fancy talks. Um, I can assure you from firsthand experience that she put as much care into her graduate course in Lie theory as she did into that ICM talk and to her sophomore course in linear algebra. And I even TA'd uh, Calc 1 for business students that was as well thought out as any of these lectures you might hear from her. Um, I looked at her CV. She gave about 10 big talks a year for 40 years with smaller ones interspersed. And so that means by my Fermi calculation, she delivered more than 2,000 puns. <laughs> and some of them were good. Some of them were eye rollers. I'm going to organize this a little bit around some of her puns. Um, she loved to talk about her family tree. Uh, if you took Lee theory from her, those characters always showed up. She had 24 PhD students, but I know there are, she had 
hundreds of other informal advisees um, throughout our community. And I think that's one of the ways she's going to be remembered the most. Here's a picture of a few of her students. Um, this file she had sent to me, and it was named GB-Family. And here's a picture of her student, Michael La, with his student, Xiao He. And this one was labeled GB Family Tree, Three Generations. Um, Georgia and her sister Paula were very close. They were named after their uncles, George and Paul. And she was proud of that. She was less happy about her very first paper. <laughs> the editor changed her name from Georgia to George. This is, she wrote this as an undergraduate, uh, way ahead of her time in theoretical math. Um, and it's really interesting to me. I was glad I pulled this out, because in this paper, she makes a generalization with some improvements. And I think that really foreshadowed so much of the kind of work she did throughout her career. One moment. All right, so I'm going to talk about some of the mathematics. Um, I'm going to center it around some of her favorite theorems. And certainly, sure vial duality is among the top. Um, she's given a lot of talks about this in the last 10 years and has been using this image increasingly. Um, I was a little bit surprised when I saw it, but then when I listened to her talk about it, she goes on to say, contrary to what that picture might suggest, this is a story of cooperation. And indeed, that's what it's about. So I'm going to go through the math kind of fast so we can get to the puns. Um, <laughs> so sorry, uh, we have a group and a finite dimensional module over the complex numbers. Many of her things that she does, in, does involves tensoring that module up k times and letting the group come in and act diagonally or simultaneously on those tensor positions, and then asking the question, what commutes, what endomorphisms on that tensor space commute with the group? Um, I don't want to add text. <laughs> that's going away. Uh, one endomorphism that's always there is tensor place permutation. So you can always mix up the tensor positions, then act simultaneously with the group, or vice versa. So there's a symmetric group always lurking around in these centralizer algebras. Um, and so I'm going to take you back to 1994 joint math meetings in Cincinnati. I might be the only one who was there. Up, oh, two, three. All right. Uh, she gave a plenary talk called A Tale of Two Groups. And in a very Dickensian fashion, she started the talk by saying, it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. And if only that talk were recorded, we could follow her thread through. But she talked about classical sure vial duality from Schur's 1900 thesis, where the group is the general linear group, and the symmetric group is all that you need in the centralizer algebra. So it generates the full centralizer algebra in this case. And she was interested in restricting to the orthogonal group inside of the general linear group, and this was studied by Richard Brower in 1937, who introduced these Brower diagrams, which have horizontal edges as well as vertical. And there's a nice way to describe what the horizontal edges do. They take advantage of the dual, the inner product that makes the orthogonal group orthogonal and projects onto a submodule for the orthogonal group. Brower also introduced this calculus of diagrams, a way of multiplying diagrams by concatenation corresponding with composition of the endomorphisms. Um, what's interesting in me, reflecting back, this was 1994, something she didn't talk about was what if you restrict one step further to the symmetric group inside of the orthogonal group? This is a really natural and interesting question that Paul Martin and Vaughn Jones were doing at that very time and thinking about statistical mechanics and the POTS model. And what they discovered was, so as you restrict, the centralizer gets bigger because there are fewer things you need to commute with. And so what you get is what is the partition algebra, which is something that Georgia came to study quite a lot. And so here we look at the edges, the connected components of those diagrams partition the 2K vertices into a, a set partition. So the dimension there is the Bell number. Um, one thing she did talk about that at, in that talk is what's now known as the Wald-Brower algebra. So she had six PhD students at the time. And to keep us busy, she had us reading Brower's papers and some follow-ups. And she asked the question, what if we add some copies of the dual module? This is a natural thing to do because you get a bigger class of GLN modules in that case. And what we discovered together is you get 
diagrams which the vertical edges have to stay on one side of the wall and the horizontal edges must cross the wall to match the V and the V star. Um, you can see if you twist the, at the wall, you get K plus L factorial such diagrams. And there's beautiful combinatorics of rational tableau that live here. Um, and so she wrote this paper with her students. I was one of them in seminar style. And this is one of the first examples of a way to lead graduate students that way, I would say. And I mostly talked about it for the following reason. Um, she would refer to this paper as being by Chakrabarty, Helverson, LeDuc, Lee, Strumer, and I, so that she could stick the I in the appropriate place. And that's the name of the file on my computer still. Um, great. So uh, she's been thinking a lot about walking on graphs in the past 10 or 15 years. <clears throat> and my, one of my favorite lines of hers in this way, she said it's a pedestrian approach to doing representation theory. <laughs> um, we also gave a special, we organized a special session at MathFest in Madison in 2012, and it was about wa walking on graphs. And she had the clever idea of naming the session, walk the walk, talk the talk. <laughs> I miss her. Um, so yeah, I've mentioned Shervile sure duality is a, a story of cooperation. Just quickly, um, because the group and the centralizer algebra commute with each other, you can decompose tensor space in several different ways. As a bimodule for the pair of them, and so you get a tensor of two irreducibles, and they're labeled by the same index. So the group and the centralizer algebra have the same set index as the irreducibles, or you could decompose as a group module, or you could decompose as a centralizer algebra module. And the nice thing that happens is the multiplicity of the group irreducibles is the dimension of the centralizer irreducible and vice versa. And so that's one of the main ways they're cooperating with each other. <clears throat> and so Georgia wanted to count some of those multiplicities. And so um, by walking, so if your group happens to be finite and you can list all of the irreducible modules, you can ask the question, what happens if I take the V from the tensor space and tensor it onto each one of those irreducibles and then re-decompose it? So what is the multiplicity of Vj in Vi tensor V? And so <clears throat> if we make a matrix out of those multiplicities, it's called the Mackay matrix, and you can think of it as the adjacency matrix of a graph, represent, sometimes called the representation graph or the Mackay quiver. It'll have Mij edges from I to J. And then if you just think about the recursion, if I want to do k-fold tensor product, I'll do k minus 1. And when I tensor on the kth, that's exactly what I need to know at the end, is how do the v tensors onto the irreducibles. Um, so here's a quick, nice example. This is the binary tetrahedral group. It has 24 elements. It's a two-fold cover of the alternating group A4. It has seven irreducible modules. I'm going to take v1, which happens to be two-dimensional, and tensor it up k times. And to understand that, the representation graph, the Mackay quiver looks like this. So V1 is the one in reddish that we're tensoring by. So for example, V1 tensor V2 is V1 plus V3 plus V3 prime is the way to read that. And so by induction, it's easy to see that the multiplicity of VI in tensor space is the number of walks from the trivial from V0 to I of length K on this graph. And a better way to see this sometimes is to stretch it out into a Bradley diagram. So here, for example, on level six, I put all the nodes that you can reach in six steps on that graph. And so then walks on the Mackay quiver become paths on the Bradley diagram. And they're a little bit easier to count. So for example, that, that 16 um, here means you can get it from the six plus the five plus the five, the way you add on Pascal's triangle about it, above it. And on the walks, they're sort of all over top of each other and a little bit harder. And just a reminder, this is the multiplicity of VI for the group, and it's the dimension of the centralizer algebra module. Um, the connection to the Mackay correspondence is that the T that I just showed you is one of the five kinds of finite groups subgroups of SU2. These were classified by Felix Klein, the same year Schur was doing his work. Um, and John Mackay in 1980 noticed if you make the representation graphs, you get exactly the simply laced affine Dinkin diagrams of type A, D, and E. So this is this magical Mackay correspondence. Those are the 
the, those Dinkin diagrams or representation graphs. And so one project that Georgia and I did in 2016, it appeared, with an undergraduate um, was to describe the centralizer algebra of these groups using, the, using these Dinkin diagrams or Mackay graphs. So just one quick result we got is that the temporally Lieb algebra is the centralizer of SU2. And the centralizer is generated by temporally Lieb, plus every time there's a branch, when it, if ever there's a branch in the, in the Dinkin diagram, you add one more generator. And then the relations that are involved just in the geometry of the locally in that graph. So it's really some elegant mathematics. Um, if you want to do the same thing for the symmetric group, if you want to tensor it up a bunch of times, remember the partition algebra is its centralizer, um, you'd need to know what the permutation module does when you tensor an irreducible. And there's this beautiful identity. That tensor product is functorally equivalent to restricting to Sn minus 1 and inducing back. So the rule is take a box off lambda and put it back on there somewhere else. So the representation graph here, you can draw this way. So this is for S4. You just remove a box to get a partition of three and add it back on and remove a box. And so that's a nice way to think of the representation graph and the Bradley diagram. It's nice to keep track of these half levels where you've removed things. And so there actually are half partition algebras that we can study. Um, so that 10 there is the multiplicity of that S4 module in tensor space, and it's the dimension of the centralizer module um, the P at level three, sorry. Um, and so there are 10 paths to that node, and one thing we discovered is in the same way Young's lattice, the paths can be encoded by standard tableau, the paths on this, on this lattice can be encoded by what we called set partition tableau, but are often called set tableau, where you put a set partition of one, two, three, because you're on level three into that shape in there's sort of 10 different ways to do it, and they give us a path. Um, we posted that, that article on the archive, um, and I think like within a couple days, uh, Rosa Orellana and Mike Zabraki posted a different article about the partition algebra using almost the same kind of set partition tableau, and then a bunch of other people have worked on these since then and connected with the combinatorics of the partition algebra. Um, one thing I want to notice, if you sum the squares, you, you get 15. If you sum all of them, you get these numbers. I told myself I wasn't going to do it, but Georgia would ask, do you recognize these numbers? Then she'd say, do they ring a bell? And <laughs> they're the bell numbers, except it breaks. So the reason you didn't say you recognize them because it breaks right there at 51, should be 52. And this is because the partition algebra, there's a kernel that starts right at that point. So it's acting injectively. Um, I can never get this right. When you double k, that's 5, and that's bigger than 4. So that's when the kernel begins. So one question this led us to believe, led us to understand, is how do you, how do you understand this kernel that's happening here? Um, and Martin and Woodcock, in a paper in 99, said it's possible that that kernel is generated by a single item potent. So this led Georgia to thinking a lot about invariant theory. She has a number of papers on invariant theory um, in the last, say, 10 years. And in her talks, she sometimes asks, what is an invariant? And then she shows this and says that it's something that doesn't move when you act on it. <laughs> I promise they weren't all good. Uh, so really quickly. Um, in classical invariant theory, it was done by Schur. You can cast it in thinking about uh, centralizers of, tensor, of this tensor product space. So the first fundamental theorem says that the permutations generate all of the invariants. The second one asks you to describe the kernel. So um, if, if you tensor fewer times than the size of the group, then there is no kernel. But once you start tensoring beyond the size of the group, there's a kernel. And this nice element of the symmetric group, which is the symmetrizer of a single strip, is an essential item potent. It squares to itself. And that generates the kernel forever. Um, there's recent work on this kernel um, for the Brouwer algebra, most especially answered by Lehrer and Zhang in 2012. There's a single item potent that generates the kernel. It's very complicated to describe. I'm not going to do that. So we wondered the same question. 
um, for the partition algebra. Again, Martin and Jones the, describe all the invariants. They come from set partitions. What is that kernel? Um, and we discovered there is a, a single item potent that except from n over 2 to n, it's a little bit weird. It depends on k, and then it's the same one going there forward. I should note that uh, Ruby and Westbury had some partial results along this same way. Um, it's kind of easy to describe. So this is the 331, except that I've done this in a different basis. So there are two bases of the partition algebra that von Jones first introduced. And this is the easy one. And then you have to re that's the orbit basis, I like to call it. But if you re-express it in the regular diagram basis, you have to lump these parts together one at a time with an alternating sign and a, a factorial that comes in there. Um, and Georgia called these essential, essential item potents. Um, so I, when I first thought of this talk, I thought I might get to all of this amazing work that she's done lately, connecting with a lot of people who are FIPSAC goers, but I didn't. Um, I will say that she's extended the idea of Markov matrices to Hopf algebras in some really interesting work, looked at applications to Markov chains and to chip firing and critical groups. Um, her talks on those things are really great and full of puns. Um, I just want to end by talking about Georgia in retirement. So I noted that she retired in 2007. And since then, she wrote 46 papers. She won a bunch of big prizes. She gave over 100 lectures in retirement. Um, she was the AMS Associate Secretary for quite a long time. She order, organized four joint math meetings, the, the scientific contact, including one of them twice, the, the Seattle meeting got canceled uh, in person and got reorganized online. And she did the online version within the month of her death. So she was working really hard right up until the end. She was the president of the AWM, trustee at MSRI. Um, and I think, you know, the way I still will mostly remember her, and I think many people do, is just through the incredible way she supported and mentored a whole generation of mathematicians. So I'm just going to end with a few pictures of some of these. Um, so she started, was one of the people who started some of these groups. Um, so this is WinArt, Women in Non-Commutative Algebra and Representation Theory. This is her team. You'll recognize some of these people. I'm not going to read all the names in the interest of time. Here's the full WinArt group that year. And I think it's important she had a team that she worked closely with, but her impact was really broad. I was at these meetings. Um, here's Algebraic Combinatorics II at Banff, some other people that you know. Um, and there's the full group that it contains more of you. Um, here's WinArt 2019. This is Ellen Kirkman, who um, wrote a really beautiful thing about Georgia in the, in the notices that we wrote. Here's the full win art. Um, and one, I just want to make one last, she wasn't just doing this, she was still traveling to all kinds of conferences. In 2018, she went to the Southeast Lee Theory Conference. You can easily spot her there in the front row. Um, and she gave a really incredible series, four, four days of lectures. And I just wanted to highlight the slide. I wasn't joking. Um, if you liked or interested in learning more about any of the things I said, she covers a lot of it over four days in these talks, and they're really good. Any of her work on YouTube is really great. Um, so I'm going to stop with one of my favorite pictures. This is the year she got tenure. It was taken by Paul Helmos uh, when she was visiting Indiana University. Um, I knew I was going to have trouble thinking of something to say and actually delivering it, so I, I stealing from Ellen Kirkman here is something she wrote in the notices article. I'm just going to read the last little chunk, which said that jo Georgia was a kind, gentle, warm, brilliant, humble, and generous person with a wonderful sense of humor and much common sense. I think that's really a good description of her. So thank you. Could answer questions, or people might have. <laughs> well, continue to tell stories. If you have some that, that I should know, please let me know. And thank you for staying late today. <laughs>